we're talking about manifesto. We've been in the series now for seven weeks. This is the seventh week of the series. I hope, I hope this series guide has been a blessing to you guys. We're hearing really good things. So if you're studying with it, that, that's great. We're actually finished with the one for our next series. Our next series is called Christmas Presents, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. Clever, clever, clever. Some of you can't spell yet. Like, that sounds fine. Um, you'll get it. You'll get it. We'll print those up and have those ready to go by Thanksgiving Sabbath. We'll have those ready to go so you can start studying and just continue on to the end of the year. We've almost finished, um, well, we have finished our sermon calendar for the next year, and we're beginning to write those um, series guides as well. So this is something we're going to continue to do. But in this series, Manifesto, what we are saying is that you are God's manifesto. You are God's revelation to the world. And as such, it's incredibly important that you have the right words and right understanding of your Christology, of who Jesus is. And we're using the book of Colossians to explain to us who Jesus is so that we can have the right words to be that manifesto, to be that declaration to the world on who Jesus is. That's really important for us. So this is what we're doing. And last week, Mike had a tough text. I don't know if you noticed this, but every time there's a really tough text that might be a little controversial, I leave town because I think it's the best thing to do. And um, so we gave it to Mike, and Mike had to deal with this text that says, you know, don't judge people for what they do or what they don't do. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we struggle with that text. We're not really sure what to do with it, so we have a tendency to ignore it, um, which is not helpful. But so I thought Mike just dove into it in a really powerful way. But those are relatively philosophical ideas judgment, not judging, this. Some of that is kind of philosophical. So what we see now is that Paul is moving from the philosophical to the practical. And some of us think this way, right? Some of us think philosophically, and then we think practically. So you think, why, do, why does the universe need a banana? And then you think, I will eat a banana, right? Other people are all practical. They're just like, I'm hungry, I'm going to eat a banana, Right? And then other people think about eating the banana or they eat the banana and then they think about the philo- philosophy of it. Paul dealt with some philosophical issues, some theological issues, and now he's moving us in to very practical issues. Paul was not lax on behavior last week. He was working against a heresy that was happening in the church. And now he's saying, listen, this is how you can actually live righteousness. And he starts it like this. Chapter 3, verse 5, we're going to chapter to verse 17. We're reading from the New Living Translation, and it starts like this. So, put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Now, Paul uses a very specific word and a phrase that he doesn't use anywhere else when he says put to death. He says, put to death sinful earthly things lurking within you have nothing to do with, and then he gives us a list. He says, have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and don't be greedy, right? And, and by the way, when, when folks who wrote in Hebrew and used Hebrew as a language, when they wrote a list, they had a tendency to write three different lists, and oftentimes they would write three lists of five things. So we have three lists that we're going to go through. This is the first one in verse 5. There's another one in verse 8. There's another one in verse 12. And so we're going to go through each one of those lists. But, but here's the thing. We just got a list of sins, and Paul is a list guy. So we just got a list of sins, and now as we exegete this text, we have to ask the question, is it, is it is it most beneficial for us to now spend time talking about those sins? Or is it most beneficial for us to now talk about something else? Now, there are some preachers and there's some teachers who think it is very appropriate. And in fact, in fact, it is, it is um, impend, not impending, what is the word I'm looking for? It's, it's necessary that we spend time on the sins. So you've got these sins there, right? Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and don't be greedy. These sins you kind of know about, and you don't know about them because you've read about them. You know about them because you've lived them, right? We all have, by the way, the word for sexual impurity, you know what that word is? It's porneia. You know what a huge problem is today? Pornography, right? So now I've got a choice to make. Do I spend my time talking about pornography and its detrimental effects on society? We can do that. Here's the only problem with it. You already know these things. The reason that you're in church is because you recognize the sin in your life and you wanted something different. You wanted something else. So I don't think it, I need to spend the next 20 minutes talking to you about your sin that you already feel convicted of and that's why you come to church. That's why you recognize your need for Jesus Christ in your life. So do we talk about the sin, even though this was a very common list of sins? Do we talk about the sin 
No, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about the sin. And Paul doesn't linger in the sin. Ever. Oh, boy, it has been a long day. I could not get that word out. Paul no longer wants to linger in the sin as well. When we ask Paul the question, do we linger in the sin? He says, no, you don't linger in the sin, and let me tell you why. You put it to death, and let me tell you why you put it to death. You put it to death because you are no longer there anymore. We don't need to deal with this sin because that sin has been dealt with because of Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross. Amen. That's great. And because of that, we don't need to linger in that sin. But he does recognize, listen, because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. Now, anger of God is something that we have a tendency to anthropomorphize. In other words, what that means is that we put human characteristics onto God when we think about that idea of anger, right? Because when I say anger, you think of somebody who you don't like when they're angry, right? You're immediately like, mm, like it could have been a father, it could have been a mom, it could have been a cousin, it could have been your wife or your husband, I hope not. Um, it could have been all these people. So when we think of the anger of God, we immediately go there in our heads. But God's anger is very significantly different than that for a couple of reasons. Number one, God's not a human being. So his anger is different. And also I think we have a tendency to think you do something and God gets angry at that thing you did. Listen, sometimes my kids don't obey me. It's hard to believe because it seems like I'm such a good parent. Um, why are you laughing now? That took a little while, that one. You're like, ha, 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 good parent. He's great. Let's start that again. Sometimes my kids don't obey me. But I got to tell you, I have a tendency not to be angry at what they did. I, I'm a little bit angry at the choice that they made because they didn't have to make that choice. You see, there's a little qualitative difference there. It's one thing to be angry at somebody because they broke a plate. It's another thing to be angry at somebody because they made the decision to throw the plate in the air, knowing that they would fall, it would fall. I couldn't care less about the plate, but come on, man, why'd you make that decision? And I think if we talk about the anger of God, that's some of the stuff we're dealing with. And, and the reason why Paul is frustrated, or God, I would say, is frustrated by this is because sin is a regression. Sin is going back. Life in Christ is about moving forward, right? But, but regression happens when we look back to the things that we don't. Remember, he says, put to death. Put it in the grave. If you put something in the grave, do you want to go look at that thing again? No, of course not. So let me tell you what happened this morning. This morning, I get up. I, I, um, I, I, I'm going to go down and work out. And as I, I wake up, I look down and I see this, um, this gift. This gift. You see, we have a cat. And this cat is, is a queen huntress, and she kills lots of things. And this cat apparently believes that somehow I am her god that she must sacrifice to. <laughs> and so she kills something, and she brings it, and she leaves it in the hallway outside of our door. And it's early when I wake up this morning, so I look, and I see that she has given me this gift. She had been scratching on the door for a while. That's kind of what woke me up, but I didn't really know why she had left at that point. I open up. There's this dead... Um, rat, mouse, I don't know what it was, it was dead. Um, so I look at it and I think, oh, she is again giving me honor and praise. <laughs> no, of course I didn't think that. I'm like, oh, that's gross. And I had a decision to make. Do I pick it up or do I make my family pick it up? And I decided to let my family pick it up. Because <laughs> it's early and I can, I can plead that I didn't see it. So I go downstairs, I do, I do my workout. Um, I'm almost done. I'm getting off the bike, and my wife, my wife walks in, and she goes, hey, um, your cat left you a <laughs> little gift. I was like, oh, did you pick it up? And she's like, no, that's your job. <laughs> so I went back up. I picked it up. I got the paper towels and, you know, picked it up and carried it out and put it in, in my trash bin. Um, Paul is saying, listen, going back to sin is like me at the end of this time here together, me going home and walking out to the trash can and opening up and going, hey, what's going on? <laughs> it's disgusting. Why would I do that? Leave something in the grave, in the grave. Your sins have been put in the grave, right? You see, you used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. But sometimes it's hard to get away from your past, isn't it? Sometimes it is. I mean, when I was in high school, I went to the same school. It wasn't that big. So you know, like you do, you date a lot of different people from a very small pool. So by the end of high school at an Avenue school, you've dated everyone. <laughs> pretty much. Pretty much. It wasn't that big a school. 
So, so life had gone by, things, you know, we'd grown up, I got married, and, you know, my wife and I have talked about who she dated, who I dated, that whole thing. Well, we, we had um, a friend from high school, I had a friend from high school who died, and we needed to go to the funeral. And um, so a lot of people were there, and a lot of the girls that I had dated were there. And so we go, and my wife's like, so who did you date here? And I was like, baby, I'm married to you now. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, did you date that girl? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and she's like, oh, okay. What about that girl, that one who's singing right now? Yes. <laughs> and I'm like, babe, we need to be here for the family, and there's a, this is a tragedy. You know what? And she's like, this is a tragedy. And I'm like, it's, it's not what I meant. Um, sometimes it's hard to get away from your past. You see, but Paul's saying now is the time. And he says it this way in Colossians 3, 8. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage. We're in the second list now. Anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Get rid of all of it. And what he's saying is he's not saying, hey, hey, you need to get rid of this. What he's saying is um, um, this is good news. You have the freedom to let them go. Freedom not to have anger. Freedom not to have rage. Freedom not to do all these things. Because let's face it, rage never ends well. You know rage doesn't end well because you drive on the 91 freeway. And rage, you have the freedom not to have road rage. Right? Because <laughs> all of a sudden it got quiet. You're like, mm. I drive the road. I'm on the 215 sometimes. Now is the time to get rid of rage, anger, malicious behavior, slander. Did you notice, by the way, that the first list represents the sins that we do against God? And that second list represents the sins that we do against one another? You know that's a direct parallel from the two tablets of the Ten Commandments, right? The first one, those first five commandments are what we do against God. The second five are what we do against other people. Paul likes to you know, really embed a lot of meaning in everything he says. And then there's this last thing that he says, and it's fascinating. He says this, don't lie to each other. And the, the language that he uses in the Greek is different. This other one, he's kind of these grand things. This one is super practical. He goes, hey, hey, don't lie to each other. For you've stripped off your old sinful nature and, and all its wicked deeds. Stop it. Stop it. You put it to death. You put it away. This one is just stop it. In the early 90s, there was this Saturday Night Live skit. And it was with a guy named Bob Newhart, and I don't know if any of you remember him, but he had like the Newhart show and all these different things. He was a comedian. But this particular skit, they set him up like he was a psychologist, and he had a line out the door of people who wanted to get his therapy. And so the first person walks in, and he says, before anything, it's $25. They put down $25. They sit down. And he goes, what's your problem? And the guy goes, listen, I'm having a hard time. I'm cheating on my wife. I'm having, and, the guy, and, and Bob Newhart goes, stop it. And he goes, yeah, yeah, but I have this. And he goes, stop it. That'll be $25. Slaps down another $25, gets out. Next person comes in, yeah, I'm having a problem drinking, da, 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 da. And he goes, stop it. Just stop it. This is what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, stop it. Don't do it anymore. Listen, you don't need to do this anymore because you've stripped off your old sinful nature. That jacket that you used to wear, the one that was all beat up, the one that was dirty, the one that had moth holes, it's gone now. You put it away. All its wicked deeds, you put it away. He's beginning to use clothing, interestingly, as a metaphor for righteousness. You took off that old coat. Why do you want to put it back on? You've got a new one now. I've got a new one for you. But here's the thing. Clothes are sometimes hard to get used to, right? You put on, we've all bought that new pair of shoes that's not comfortable, and you fight your way through it, and then they're very comfortable, and then you never want to take them off again because they are your shoes. If you've ever bought rainbow sandals in San Clemente, you know this to be true. You put them on, and for the first week, you think that they're devil's shoes, and then they're the only things that you want to wear. And Paul is saying this, listen, in 310, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. He's saying this is a process of renewal. Put on your new nature, become, be renewed, learn how to be renewed. The new self is in process, and now you have a new growth toward a new goal. He's like, listen, I gave you this jacket, you should wear it. I gave you this shirt, you should wear it. When I was growing up, when I was growing up, my dad, had, my dad had nice clothes. He liked to, he always dressed very nicely. And I liked his clothes. And so when I got a little bit bigger, I wanted to wear his clothes. 
And so when he would be down making breakfast, I would go and put some of his clothes on that I like to wear. And then I would walk down to get breakfast, and he would look at me, and he would go, that's my shirt. And I'm like, yeah, I know. And he'd be like, take it off, take it off, you're going to destroy it. What do you think I was going to do in a shirt? And I'll be like, you're going to destroy it. Put, it, put it away, put it away. And more times than not, I'd have to go put the shirt away. And like, I would be like, Dad, come on, I just want to wear it. Like, it looks good with my outfit. And he's like, go put it away. So as my boys have gotten bigger, all of a sudden they discovered that there's a whole other closet in the house. And it's mine. So I'll be downstairs, and my son, I don't remember, the first time this happened, Jake comes down, he's wearing my shirt. And I look at him, and I'm like, hey, that's my shirt. Because we have that weird DNA thing, right? That whatever we, was said to us when we were young, we are going to say to our children, you know, just for the record, it's not like, because you're going to hear it sometime in your life, and you're going to be like, I can't believe I said what my parents said. There's a reason for it. The reason is, you're not a bad person. So even though you didn't like what they said, it somehow made you into the person that you are today, and you don't have any better ideas. So you're like, well, I guess I'll just say what my dad said to me, right? It makes sense. So like, he comes down, I'm like, hey, man, that's my shirt. And he's like, yeah, look, look, it looks good on me. I'm like, yeah, you're going to destroy it. Like, what are you talking about? What am I, how am I going to destroy it? I'm like, I don't know. But then I thought about it. The reason why he likes that shirt is because that shirt's cool. That is my shirt. Therefore, heretofore, I'm cool. And he wants to look a little bit like me. Yeah. Now, I, am, I, I logically know and reasonably know that may absolutely not be the case, but give this one to me, all right? <laughs> like, I need this one. So my son wants to look like me. That's why he's wearing my clothes. God's giving you a new jacket. He's giving you a new shirt. He's giving you new clothing, a new robe. He wants you to look like him. That's why we put on this new thing, right? We put on this, you know, the old self or the old nature is gone. We've put it away. And now the new self and the new nature we wear, right? And by the way, the old self, the old nature, and the new self, the new nature, they never exist together. You take off that old jacket, you don't get to put it back on once you put the new jacket on. It's gone. You buried it forever. One replaces the other. You are never the old self. You are always the new self in Christ. And what I want you to understand by that is that even if you do one of your old self things, you are not the old self. Because those things don't define you anymore. You are the new self who's regressing a little bit and probably could work a little harder, but that's okay because you've already got the righteousness of Christ on. That's really important. I want you to understand that. And here's what's fascinating. In the Greek, there's only one word for old. I can't remember it right now, but it's this one word for old. But there's two words for new, and Paul uses both of them. He uses new in time, like, hey, this is like you got a new car. It's new to you because you didn't have it yesterday and now you have it today. But then he also has, there's also another word for new that he uses, and it means quality. So the old is gone, but the new is here, and it is of a different quality. The jacket that you got rid of is nothing like the jacket that you wear now because God's fabric is better, because God's workmanship is better. He understands it. We have a tendency to want to hold the old and the new in tension. And Paul is saying you can't do that because you're all new now. Peter Drucker says it this way. If you want, to do, if you want something new, you have to stop doing something old. You know how Proverbs says it? You'll love this. As a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his foolishness. And I know that's gross. Like, I get it. But it's good because you're going to remember that forever right? When you eat today. <laughs> You're going to remember it. He says, don't regress. You don't have to. It's not a requirement anymore. Don't go back because that's the old you and that doesn't exist anymore. Don't do it. You don't need to. In this new life, it doesn't matter. And this is fascinating, okay? So he like takes this turn and, and he understands that the church in Colossae he has just told them, right, don't lie to each other. And so we're still kind of under that declaration. But he goes, listen, I, don't lie to each other because lies separate yourselves, and so don't do that. And he says it this way in verse 11a, the first part of it. He says, in, in, in this new life, it doesn't matter if you were Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. And, and the reason why he puts that in is because they were beginning to delineate themselves away from one another. You a Jew, you a Gentile. Circumcised or uncircumcised, which is an uncomfortable conversation, but they were having it. Um, are you a barbarian? 
Are you uncivilized? Are you a slave? Are you free? And Paul's like, you know, there's no place for that here. Because under God, we're all one thing. We're all children of God, like Josh said this morning in worship. And he's moving here from just character to values, still under this command. He's like, accept each other regardless of the artificial distinction imposed by an earthly perspective, because that's old thinking. We don't have that thinking anymore. We think differently anymore. So this is the thing that gets me when you read this. How in the world can someone call themselves Christian and be a racist? How? You don't get to do that. Those two things are mutually exclusive according to God. You cannot be a Christian, someone who believes in Jesus and believes in the tenets of Jesus and still be racist. That's your old self fighting your new self. You're going to have to let one go. You have to. How can you be sexist? How can you think that another gender has something less than you? It doesn't work that way. So the question you have to ask yourself as you deal with this, and we all got to deal with this, is who are you biased against? Do you hate Patriots fans? And so far this morning, that's got the biggest laugh, bigger than Cowboys fans, right? I get it. This is dumb, right? But, but do you hate them? Do you, are you frustrated by them? How can you be racist? How can you be sexist? How can we be arrogant at all? How can we be anything less than open to all the people who Christ loves? So the question is not who are you biased against. If you call yourself a Christian, the question is who is Christ biased against? And I haven't met those people yet. I've never met them. And then in the second part of this verse, he wants to reiterate this and drive this home. And so he goes, you know what? Christ is all that matters. And he lives in all of us. You see what he just did there? He just took away every single distinction that is available to us. Absolutely. Absolutely. He said that there is nobody who's not like you if Christ is in you. You are the same people. There's no distinction, so stop trying to make some. Stop trying to make some. You have a new identity and a new identifier. It is new life in Christ, and it is all Him. And then he says this, since God chose you to be holy people, the holy people He loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. These are tough ones. Right? But he gets it, right? He understands that there's a process of getting used to the new clothes that God has given you. And so you need to practice these things. Practice tenderheartedness. Practice gentleness. Practice mercy, kindness, and patience. Patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you, you need to forgive other people. How hard are you on other people? This is present in how we drive, right? We know... How patient are you? Some of you are hard honkers, right? Light changes. Ah! Some of you are polite honkers. Ding, ding. <laughs> right? Here's the thing. He then says this in verse 14. Above all, above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us together in perfect harmony. Oh, that's good. I love the fact that he used the word bind, right? Because in, in, he uses the word bind in Greek, which then we translated into the word, um, the word for bind in Latin, which is religare, which is the word we use for religion. What do you bind yourself to? He's like, there's one thing you need to bind yourself to, and that's love. And who expresses that love most completely? Well, of course, it's Jesus. Because that's what binds us all together in perfect harmony. Now, I'm going to take just a moment here, and I apologize for this if you're not from our faith tradition, but the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been struggling with itself for a while now, and it's always, you know, around this time is when they have their year-end meetings and people fly in from all over, and they do all this policy stuff, and this last one was relatively difficult again. Uh, a few of our unions, uh, the way that we're organized, got, got warned. We got warned because we ordain women, um, and our, our union is one of those, the Pacific Union is one of those, and we ordain women in the Pacific Union. And um, so now we've been warned, which we're not, I don't think anybody really knows what that means, but, um, but we have been warned, so that's important. But 
there's a narrative that I heard both from the general conference sessions and from, from the North American division sessions, and I think everybody's a little wrong on this, and, and track with me, and you don't have to agree with me by any means, but as I'm watching these things, they're like, we need to get done with these distractions and done with these things that's causing us disunity so we can get back to mission. We need to get back to mission and what God's called us to do. We need to get back to what we are supposed to do. And the more I listened, the more I got philosophically annoyed by this. I got philosophically annoyed because I don't think we need to get back to mission. I think we need to get back to Jesus, right? Because if Christ is all, that's what we should be talking about. If Christ is all, this is a thing that should fill our hearts. There is no unity in mission. There is only unity in Christ. And once we understand Christ, He gives us our mission. Our missiology comes directly from our Christology. What Jesus, who Jesus is, decides our mission. And you know what? Our mission may be a little bit different but that doesn't mean we're not unified. So we talk about mission and it's still about us. We need to start talking about Jesus. We need to start talking about Christ at a much higher level than we ever have before if we hope to have any unity in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, now I get it, I get it. I, I'm just naive, right? I'm just a pastor, like I don't know that much. I'm just naive. We got policy, we got things, we got... Listen, I, I, I think... Paul says it this way. Let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as a member of one body, you are called to live in peace. And always be thankful. You know that word rule? Let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. The word rule is often translated as umpire. So so if you're wondering what you're supposed to do, let the peace that comes from Christ be the thing that decides for you. Focusing on Christ creates a rule or umpire of peace in the church. You know why? Because when we focus on Christ, other issues fall into the background. And I get it. It's naive. It's naive. But you know what? Rather than being a critic of someone with an agenda, maybe we should go to them and first share the goodness of Christ. Not what Christ is showing you about them. That's manipulative. That's corrective. But let the binding that happens in Christ guide our conversation. What I'm telling you is that maybe we need to lose our agenda for somebody else and have only the agenda of Christ. I dare you to lose your agenda and see what kind of peace it brings into your life and into the life of the church. And then then he just ends like this. He goes, listen, let the message about Christ in all its richness Fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. You see, Paul understands that when you don't fill your life with Christ, when you don't fill your heart with Christ, something else will fill those extra spaces. And that other stuff, that will incarnate in the world too. All the anger, all the hatred, all the frustration, all the impatience, all the rage, all the immorality, all that will incarnate into the world too. So don't give it any space in your life. Fill your hearts with Christ so that there is nothing else that can fill that space because there are no cracks in Christ. Inside there, I don't know if you've ever said this, but like, you know, the dessert comes and you go, oh, I'm so full. And then you go, yeah, but the the ice cream just fills in the cracks, right? There's no cracks in Christ when he fills your heart. There's no way to put anything else in there. It's full. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Let's pray. Lord, let us be those people. And let us sing to you those songs, those hymns, those songs of praise to you. May we do it together, bound together in your love. May your love be the umpire of our hearts. And Lord, may we wear this new righteousness that comes only from you. May we wear it as our own clothes. May we be comfortable in those skins. Make your life our habit. In your name I pray, Lord. Amen.